This video is made possible by Trends. Trends is the ultimate knowledge hub from the hustle. Trends is a networking community for entrepreneurs and budding entrepreneurs. It's a place where you can connect and even workshop with investors and founders who can share valuable insights to help get your ideas off the ground. Trends brings together expert knowledge, data science, and investigative journalism to track new industries and likely trends. Do you remember our video about the surprising success of A2 Milk that outstripped tech companies in profits in 2019? Well, over on Trends, you can find in-depth trends analysis on the alternative milk industry, as well as detailed reports on loads of niche markets that could really help you to capitalize on your own ideas. Or maybe you're stuck for ideas. Dive into Trends' exclusive research with intriguing topics to help inspire, like the 30 companies defining the future of media and pop culture, or data on thousands of successful Kickstarter projects. We also like the live weekly lectures from founders who give practical tips about everything from internet security to branding to getting the most out of YouTube. Hey, you're never too old to learn something new. Best of all, right now, you can get your first seven days for just $1. Go to trends.co slash VP for your $1 seven day trial. Now, let's see what Grant is talking about today. So my friends of Visual Politic, today we are going to talk about a thorny issue because we are going to focus on the company where Visual Politic is hosted and one which owns the platform both you and I are using right now. We are talking about Alphabet. And you'll say, but wait a minute Grant, Alphabet? You're on YouTube. Well, yes, we are on YouTube, but YouTube is a part of Google. And in turn, Google is the main subsidiary of the conglomerate Alphabet. And that means that we're not just talking about YouTube, but we're also talking about Google Maps, Google Earth, Android, Google Drive, and a long list of other things. You see, my friends, the internet is big and diverse, but most of what you find on here comes under the umbrella of, or is dependent on, five major players. Alphabet, i.e. Google, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, and Microsoft. These five large companies are also called, annoyingly, GAFAM, or more properly, big tech. And so you'll say, so what's the problem, Grant? For example, if it weren't for a platform as big as YouTube, visual politic wouldn't exist, nor would almost any of the channels that you all like so much, and which have started with some friends recording videos at home. Yes, we could have a website, but who would know about us without a search engine like Google? We would have had to spend thousands of dollars in advertising just to reach you. And that's unthinkable for almost any YouTuber. However, there is a risk. I'll give you an example. Today, the Google search engine has more than 80% of the market worldwide. There are very few countries where Google is not the dominant search engine. Russia, where it competes with Yandex, and China, where it is obviously banned. It's China after all. In the rest of the world, Google is the main search engine. And when I say main, I mean that in countries as widespread as Spain, India and Brazil, more than 90% of searches are made through Google. In other words, we could talk about the existence of a Google monopoly on searches. The name of the company even means to search. I'll just Google it. And you're probably thinking, but is this really a problem? Well, it depends on how you look at it. On the one hand, Google has earned its position by providing a fantastic service. The question now is, could a company emerge that would be able to compete with them? And many of you will think, what does it matter which search engine you use if you only use them for, well, for everything. The search engine is the first thing we use before entering a website. That is, if something does not appear in the first search results of a Google search, then that thing basically doesn't exist. This means Google has a lot of power. In theory, this power isn't necessarily bad, but sometimes it can have consequences like this. Antitrust. EU Commission fines Google 2.42 billion euro for abusing dominance as search engine by giving a legal advantage to own comparison shopping service. EU Commission. This is just one of the many fines that the European Commission has imposed on Google for what they call abusing its market position. As of today, Google is appealing these fines in court. None of these cases has an easy answer. Europe says Google is abusing its market position. Google says that both its search engine and its Android operating system are theirs. It is logical that if you enter a store, the owner wants to promote their product over any others for whatever reason. As you can see, we are talking about a debate where even the team here at Visual Politic don't really have a clear opinion. And I know what many of you are probably thinking. What if this was a strategy by Europe to punish an American company? Well, the truth is that these legal battles are not limited to Europe. 
Check this out. U.S. Justice Department and 11 states accuse Google of antitrust violations. The lawsuit accuses Google of using its enormous size to illegally monopolize the market for search-generated advertising. NBC News. As you can see, this is a charge very similar to those that Europe has already presented, and the judicial process will most likely go on for years. Again, we are talking about a debate where there is no easy answer. Before going any further, we have to say that Google is not the only company facing antitrust battles. Apple. Facebook and Amazon are going through very similar processes. But in this video, we are going to focus on the Alphabet Group. That is to say, we are going to focus on Google. So if the lights go out and this video cuts off halfway through, you know why. Today the question we are asking is, so where does this legal battle come from? To what extent are we talking about economic reasons or simple political interests? How does anti-monopoly legislation work? We are going to answer all of these questions, but first, let's look at some history. The Great Dilemma of Capitalism Capitalism is an economic system that is based on you being able to start a business and if you provide a good service to people, you will do well. And if you give extraordinarily good service, you can become practically the only provider of this service. This really doesn't happen as often as people think. In fact, most of the monopolies that exist in the world are state-generated monopolies. In other words, most of the monopolies in the world are owned by public companies. For example, in Spain, Renfe has a monopoly on trains. Some postal services are a state monopoly in the United States. But there are also monopolies that arise from the free market system itself. And this collides with another basic principle of our beloved capitalism, competition. That is, as long as there are several companies competing in a field, products will usually improve in quality and reduce in price. If one company is not offering quality and good value, customers will go to another. If a company is big enough, it can buy off its potential competitors. For example, when Facebook bought Instagram, it ended up with one of its biggest competitors. Is this good? or bad for the market. There are valid opinions from every point on the spectrum. And this is when we talk about antitrust laws and abuse of a dominant position. An example of this would be Microsoft. If you remember, back in the 1990s, Microsoft had a monopoly on operating systems. 90% of personal computers around the world used Windows. So the question was not between Microsoft or Apple, but between Windows 95 or Windows 98. And then, this happened. Justice Department files antitrust suit against Microsoft for unlawfully monopolizing computer software markets. Justice.gov This 1998 lawsuit became Bill Gates' nightmare. He was driven so crazy by this that many years later he would invent a COVID-19 vaccine just so he could track us all. That is a joke. What actually happened is the Department of Justice accused Microsoft of unfair competition, illegal exclusivity clauses, and also of abusing its dominant position by including its own Internet Explorer browser in the Windows operating system. And I think we can all agree that forcing us to use Internet Explorer was a crime. The result, however, is this. Microsoft ordered to split into two companies, The Guardian. In fact, Microsoft had to split into two. One company in charge of operating systems and the other in charge of software. However, Microsoft appealed and reached a less drastic, but still quite painful agreement. It accepted that competing companies would have access to its systems and application programming interfaces for the following five years. These days, 20 years after that lawsuit, Microsoft no longer has a monopoly on operating systems. Apple has gained more market share than it had before, and there are even people who use their cell phones more than computers. So operating systems like Android are coming into play. In other words, Microsoft is still a very competitive company, but it no longer has a monopoly. And here comes the big question that will blow your mind. Would this have happened if it wasn't for government intervention? Or was there always room for companies to outshine Microsoft? I'll leave that for you to reflect on. But now, let's get back to something we can answer. What are they accusing Google of? What are the charges they are bringing to accuse Google of monopolistic practices? Let's take a look at that right now. Don't be evil! As you all know, Google is one of those companies created by an immigrant. Sergey Brin is one of the co-founders of Google with Larry Page. Brin is of Russian origin. In 1995, these two students from Stanford devised the basic algorithm of what would later become Google. Three years later, they already had investors, a company incorporated under the clever name Google Incorporated, and even their own headquarters, which was a garage. A garage that 
by the way, was owned by the person who would later become the CEO of YouTube. At that time, the internet was just beginning. It only had 200 million users worldwide. Even so, there were already search engines like Yahoo, Yandex, and AltaVista, plus a long list of others that everyone's forgotten. Many of them even advertised on TV. How'd you find this place? Yahoo. Although there was not yet a clear business model, investors were convinced that the internet was the future. So the race to adapt was wild. Now, the next time you think you've made the biggest mistake of your life, remember Excite. You probably don't even know what I'm talking about, do you? Well, in the late 90s, Excite was one of the most important portals on the internet, with its own search engine, an email service, and a lot more. In 1999, Page and Bryn wanted to sell their fledgling Google to Excite for the grand sum of, wait for it, $750,000. That's right, $750,000. It wasn't even worth a million. However, Excite declined the offer and they weren't the only ones. Yahoo did exactly the same thing. Both companies knew that Google's algorithm offered slightly better results than theirs. But with the algorithms they already had, they weren't doing so badly. Why change something that already works? Three years later, Excite was bankrupt. To fully understand this, you have to think about the disruption that Google represented at that time. Google prioritizes results based on what matters to the user. This may seem obvious today, but at that time, search engines prioritize results based on their own interests. But not only that, Google was the only search engine designed to do just that, search. Yahoo and many others tried to offer an all-in-one for you to stay on their website. News, weather, and even games. In other words, Google offered a much better product for users. And users rewarded Google with their trust. In fact, the slogan that summarizes the philosophy of this company and can be seen in all its offices is menacingly, don't be evil. In other words, don't be evil and don't become one of those big and soulless evil companies. In fact, today, Google is one of the companies that treats its employees best. If you want to know what a really fancy breakfast is, make friends with someone who works at Google. You will never see a bigger and better free buffet in your life. So I'm told anyway, knowing it. Google wants to be friends with me. And the truth is that this formula has worked for them until this point. When Google went public in 2004, its shares were worth $85. It was already a company comparable to Ford with a market capitalization of $23 billion. Well, these days we're talking about a trillion. So, what did Google do to grow so much? As you know, nowadays Google is a conglomerate that offers all kinds of services. It has the most used browser in the world, cloud services, and, of course, this service. Google buys YouTube for $1.65 billion, NBC News. In short, Google has totally changed how we use the internet. And, let's be clear, it has changed it for the better. Without looking too far, YouTube has achieved what no public television station has ever achieved. The distribution of educational and informative content to millions of people. Look, Google, I said it. Please don't demonetize our channel. And I know what you're all thinking. Of course, Grant. It's normal to think that way. Google has literally changed our life. Don't worry about it. And if you think that, let's see what the problem is with the fact that Google is just so big. The abuse of power. You don't become a trillion dollar company without making enemies. One of the first was none other than the country France. When Google Books came out, the French government refused to let a foreign company digitize its cultural heritage. So France put pressure on Brussels to create a state version of Google Books. Europan. The truth is that this product has ended up being a bit of a disaster. Other enemies of Google are the traditional companies whose business model gets upset by the internet. An example of this is the case of Google News against Spanish media. In 2004, the Spanish government passed a law by which portals such as Google News had to pay a fee to the media in order to show clips of the news, which is what Google News does. What happened next will not surprise you. Google to shut down news site in Spain over copyright fees. Reuters. But it must be recognized that there are also cases where legitimate criticism can be made of Google. There are cases where we could perhaps speak of a certain unfair advantage. One of these cases is Google Maps. Google created its mapping service in 2005, but of course, before that time, there were already lots of companies offering maps on the internet. If you had a website and you wanted to insert a map with your address, you could hire one of these companies. And this obviously had a cost. But then 
Google came along and they did it for free. As a consequence, many digital mapping companies were automatically bankrupt. Years later, without any competitors left standing, Google Maps became a paid service. That is, using Google Maps at home is free. But using the Google Maps API for a large website does incur a charge. In this matter, the French company bought in cartographies, even sued Google Maps in the Tribunal de Commerce. They accused the tech company of what is known as dumping. That is, taking advantage of the fact that you are a very big company to set very low prices for a while in order to raise your competitors to the ground. We also have the case of Android. Google bought Android Inc. in 2005. Today, seven out of 10 mobile devices in the world use Android. In this market, Google is the king. And this means that it can use all these devices to promote the rest of its services. That is, you buy an Android phone and have the Google search engine on the main screen. Chrome is the default browser and Google Play installed by default. Someone who has another application store would have a hard time competing with Google simply because they have such a hold on the market with Android. And this was precisely the reason for the fine of more than $4 billion that the European Commission imposed on Google in 2018. Something similar happens with Google Shopping. If you search for a product on Google, the first strip that appears are the products that Google itself sells. And that's why both Europe and the United States are putting so many demands on this company. In fact, the US Department of Justice's lawsuit against Google is the largest in the industry since the Microsoft case in 1998. What's more, if the case against Google is successful, it will also have direct consequences for other big tech companies, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple. What could happen? If Google loses, the easiest thing would be to fine it as the European Commission did. But in this case, the question is, to what extent does a fine really affect a company as gigantically rich as Google? At the other extreme, we have the proposals like that of US Senator Elizabeth Warren. Elizabeth Warren says she wants to break up Amazon, Google, and Facebook, The Verge. What Elizabeth Warren proposes to do is to separate Google into several different companies. It wouldn't be the first time that something like this has happened. The great precedent is AT&T, the giant telecommunications company in the United States. In 1984, it was forced to split into several small companies known as the Big Brothers. That's another joke. It was called the Baby Bells. So what's the problem? The problem is that these measures violate property rights. But that's not all. Most likely, the companies that would emerge from Google's atomization would end up being monopolies in their respective niches. So the most likely option is that the United States would force Google to share its platform and some of its algorithms with competitors. And here, we come back to the question with which we started this whole video. Is it really so impossible to compete with Google even if you have a better service? As you can imagine, Google says no. Their lawyers argue that if Alphabet companies have got where they are, it's only because they are better. And it is likely that we will have the answer soon. Tech companies, including Spotify and the maker of Fortnite, seek to reform app stores. Market watch. It is very likely that several tech companies will end up joining together to create their own Google Play competitor. These companies complain about the commissions they have to pay to be in the app stores. And maybe they'll come up with their own alternative. At that point, we'll see how easy or difficult it is to compete in a segment as momentous as mobile applications. In the meantime, here are a couple of questions for you. Do you think that the European fines on Google are effective? Do they really encourage competition and creativity? Or is it really Google's bad luck that no one has found a formula to compete with its search engine? In short, why do almost all of us use Google? And we're not looking for filthy answers. I know why some of you use Google. You can leave your answers in the comments. As always, we really hope you enjoyed this video. Please hit like if you did, and don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos. Don't forget to check out our friends too at the Reconsider Media Podcast. They provided the vocals in this episode that weren't my dulcet tones. Finally, this channel is possible because of Patreon and our patrons on that platform. Please consider joining them and supporting our mission of providing independent political coverage. And as always, I'll see you next time. And if you want to learn more about politics and hear even more of my lovely voice, you can join us at Reconsider Media. We have a podcast at reconsidermedia.com slash podcast. See you there.